across the globe in famous cities and exotic resorts. There are restaurants that most of us can only dream of visiting. We'll glimpse inside these exclusive spaces. We'll get a taste of the lifestyle that goes with them. And we'll meet the men and women who have made them what they are. This time... Beautiful psychedelic veal, not flame grill. So that's amazing. You have got delicious food, but you know, everything else around is buzzing. It wants to add to a whole theater. If you work very hard and you put all of your energy and focus into one thing, dreams can come true. You can't get much more Italian than Modena in northern Italy. It's the birthplace of Pavarotti, home to balsamic vinegar, tortellini pasta, and also some of the most famous supercars in the world. The city is nestled in the Emilia-Romagna region, famous for its culinary tradition. But in the tiny back streets of the old town is a three Michelin starred restaurant that is challenging the way Nonna used to cook. If you are passionate about something, you can transfer the emotion because you can feel it, you live it. With as much oomph and style as a supercar. This is Osteria Francescana. I think the food we create is like a, a, an edible compression of passion. Massimo is a very gentle dictator. The secret is keep a little space open for poetry. My perfect dining experience, I just want it to be unique. I want it to give me something to think about. I want it to be delicious and soulful and thoughtful, beautiful, creative, something that shows me a side of food I've never seen before. Chef Massimo Bottura was raised on the traditional regional dishes that were cooked in his family kitchen. Is that you see? Little pasta filled with uh, pork and veal. So this is uh, the dish that I, I grew up with. But in the small 12-table restaurant he runs with his American wife, Lara, old conventions are lovingly reinvented. Massimo has been obsessed with this idea of tradition and evolution. And Italy is one of those cultures that has combinations of flavors and recipes that get passed down from generation to generation. But you, as a contemporary chef, have a choice. I mean, you're not your grandmother anymore. You are yourself, and you have your own cultural baggage. It's not just about good food. If you want good food, you, can, you could go to my mom's place. She was an excellent cook, and she was cooking beautiful food. But the experience in Osteria is a different experience. When you have a big tradition, you feel comfortable in nostalgia. But if you look at the critic way and you ask yourself question, like, why do I have to boil the meat into the water? You know, because tradition told me that. You know, it's opening doors. Doors in which I can walk in and uh, see things uh, from a different point of view. Massimo's different culinary point of view can be enjoyed a la carte or from a choice of two tasting menus. At 170 euros, tradition in evolution is a modern twist on regional fare. The sensations menu, 195 euros, is more experimental. By looking afresh at traditional methods and recipes, Massimo celebrates them. There's a new recipe on the menu called uh, 
rizzo and polenta in praise of pizza. This dish combines risotto and polenta from northern Italy with pizza and tomatoes from the south. In a country with distinctive regional cuisine, Massimo is challenging perception and history. As fun and ironic as the plate is and as beautiful and flavorful it is, there's also some deep thought going on there. And I think Massimo is really asking you to put your preconceptions of the Italian kitchen aside and look at it from another point of view. It's like a surfer that is on the, on the wave. You know, I'm like, I feel like that, you know? I never look at my past. I know where is my past. It's there. It's back there. And I know where I come from. Exactly. But my mind is always on. It's always to the next and the next and the next. It is taking things that people think they know and love and don't want to change and changing them. It is change that's been embraced with evangelical zeal by the rest of the kitchen staff. Our goal is to feed people's minds, take people on a different kind of journey, and help them see things from a different angle. This food doesn't exist just to satisfy people's hunger. Uh, you know, there's you know, tagliatelle ragu down the street, and there's pizza around the corner for those kinds of things. When Osteria Francescana opened in 1995, it was a new departure, not just for fine dining in Modena, but for Massimo and Lara. The day that we opened, I couldn't be in Modena. My dad had just had an operation, so I was in New York with him. And just before opening, Massimo called me on the phone, and he said, you know, in about 20 minutes, we're going to be opening the doors for Francescana. But before I open the doors, I needed to ask you a question. Uh, will you marry me? And I actually said to him, I haven't had a coffee yet. Can I call you back? But I knew that the answer was yes. In hindsight, really, he was asking me to marry the restaurant, which has been my job and my vocation and uh, my passion as much as Massimo's. It's my whole life. It's our life. The restaurant received its first Michelin star in 2002. Its second, four years later, and its third star in 2012. But the early years weren't always easy. It's been hard because maybe I was pushing too much and I was too much uh, provocating, you know. Massimo in the beginning was very provocative and he really wanted to shake up the modernist clients who weren't quite ready for what he wanted to do now. Osteria Francescana in Italy boasts three Michelin stars and an avant-garde approach. As well as being a showcase for Massimo's modern Italian cuisine, the restaurant doubles as an art gallery, curated by his wife, Lara. I came to the culinary world from an art background and I was looking at everything through those lenses. Massimo came to the art world through a culinary background and that was a great meeting of minds. If there's one thing that the artwork and the recipes do together is they, they, they have narratives. Lara was the one who introduced me to contemporary art. She's the one who made visible the invisible. This multicolored dish is an homage to one of the UK's most successful artists. So Massimo read an article that Damien Hirst had hung one of his spin paintings in a fast food uh, location in London. You know, Damien Hirst is one of my favorite artists. It's amazing. The title of the, um, the Hirst painting was something like 
beautiful psychedelic, uh, gherkin pickles, shooting tomato all over your face, flame grilled. And this was so exciting to him. Fast food, slow food, fast painting, slow painting. What am I going to do with that? What Massimo did became one of the most popular dishes on the menu. Beautiful psychedelic, spin painted veal, not flame grilled. It was a great success. I'm gonna keep the, the meat here. I'm gonna put the, the red there. Not only was it flavorful and delicious, and the meat was cooked sous vide, so very slow cooking as opposed to the fast food restaurant. It wasn't grilled. So there were all these layers of meaning and metaphor playing on that idea, but there was also this sort of ode to Damien Hirst. There's been a long debate around high-end restaurants as to whether they are art or food. Um, in the sense that good art should reflect the world around us, I think they are on the level of high craftsmanship. What they're really doing is processing ingredients in a new way, and you think about them again. So the very best restaurants will present those flavours in a way that thrill and excite you. Earlier this year, art and food came full circle when the artist heard word of Massimo's tribute. Massimo received an email early 2015 saying, Damon Hurst would like to lend you, for your restaurant, a spin painting. You rename the, 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 the title, you, you retitled that. that so so the, the, this uh, beautiful spin painting was renamed like as beautiful sonic disco of love and hate at the gate of hell painting with wicked pools of glorious color and the beautiful psychedelic veal, not flame grill. So that's amazing. Massimo's enthusiasm embraces all of his staff in the kitchen and front of house. I have uh, Lara, I have two kids, but my family is the whole team. And uh, we live uh, this restaurant as it was a family. You know, these guys, are part of the creative process because uh, I always ask them to bring their culture, to bring their knowledge and uh, express themselves. Massimo understands the way that uh, we think, each and every one of us, he understands our strengths and our weaknesses and uh, he works with them. We are a group of people that believe in this project, the passion becomes your life because take 24 hours a day your mind, uh, focus on, the, on, the, on the, what, what are you doing. Front of house, staff include identical twins, Andrea and Luca. Lara and Massimo, they are uh, taking uh, us uh, as a family. You are actually part of, uh, of the restaurant. You are part of uh, this, uh, uh, this dream, because this is uh, our dream. In the restaurant, uh, we are uh, about 35 and guests are between 25 and 30. So we definitely more uh, employer than guest, but it's very important because we have to give them the best experience possible in Italian style. With top end restaurants around the world, I think it's the people within have a desire to do great things and to do something amazing that's gonna be memorable for the guest. It is a team effort. At the end of the day, it's about culture, and it's about knowing collectively and for every individual what is good and what is bad, and how you're going to get this experience to be fantastic. The team is uh, everything in a restaurant like this. Dishwasher, the guy who's with a great smile is opening the door and say, welcome, or goodbye. You know, that's very important. And if everyone is alert and knows that the whole team is getting so strong. My favorite memories uh, from this place are, you know, the guys after dinner playing soccer in the rain. Or massive water fights that we've had. Just us really living as, you know, a family, brothers and sisters and, and we have been able to find a way to work and live at the same time. We've really found harmony for the two.
you cannot improvise to be a, a great chef, but great chef can improvise. Massimo is a person who keeps you on your toes. When he's around, there is a sense that, you know, you maybe you stand up a little bit straighter and you perform a little bit better. He is a perfectionist and is constantly pushing us forward. He is so volcanic, you know, it's that the idea of the, the volcano that its explosions are scary, but they're very productive and things happen. Sharing is a very important word. Obsession is another important word, but sharing with the team, sharing with the, our small town, sharing with our artisan, cheesemaker, farmer, fisherman. That's the most important thing. Cooking is not just about the quality of the ingredients, but also the quality of the ideas. In the American state of Virginia, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, is the sleepy country town of Washington, with a population of just 133 people. It's an unlikely location for a restaurant that has achieved Triple A's highest award, the Five Star Diamond, 27 years in succession. A culinary shrine that attracts visitors from all over the world, this is the Inn at Little Washington. sort of let yourself dream and you work very hard and you put all of your energy and focus into one thing and you sacrifice the rest of your life, uh, dreams can come true. Little Washington was converted out of what used to be a gas station, 70 miles west of Washington, D.C. At a minimum, the average person drives two hours to get to us. That's a big commitment of time. It's rare and unusual to find a phenomenon like this going on in such a rural area. The fact that it's geographically resembling parts of England made it seem more like an English country house. We like to think that it's a stage set and it's a fantasy. Chef and hotel owner Patrick O'Connell was a teenager when he stumbled upon the obsession he would make his lifelong career. The first job I ever had was in a restaurant at age 15. It's an addiction that immediately takes hold. It's something about restaurant people they're unusual, they're eccentric, they're fun, uh, wild and crazy. Definitely not normal. And I felt I had found my people. When I go into transforming food into something, I feel like it's a magic act. 110 staff work at the inn, nearly as many as the entire population of the tiny town. When people ask me to describe the restaurant or what goes on here, I start to sweat. <laughs> you have to experience it, you have to feel it, you, you have to surrender to it. And no matter who you are, it will probably get you. Patrick began the creation of his fantasy hotel come restaurant in 1980. At first, he struggled to have his design ideas realized. We were dealing with a local architect whose favorite color was white. And I said, we may have a problem. So I pushed him and he said, well, if you insist, I have a friend living in London who's absolutely mad 
and I'll see if she has any thoughts or ideas. That friend was artist and designer Joyce Conway Evans. A collaboration that began 40 years ago continues to this day. Patrick will ring and say, we're about to decorate a room. I set up my drawings. They grow a bit bigger <laughs> as the painting progresses. I create, really, the basics. And then Patrick does the enrichments with his impeccable taste and his choice of things that complete the interiors. The design of the restaurant, of course, is very important and you need to think about it because if you do not think about it and you design it wrong, this is going to impact negatively on, on the guest experience forever until you change it. So you've got to think about it always from a guest perspective and you've got to think about it long term. When diners first come in, they're, they're stunned, overwhelmed by all the detail and the opulence of the, the decor. We like to do slightly over the top um, which is, I think, a good thing to do. There's silk on the walls. We have the tapestries. The way that the lighting comes directly down so the guests can focus on each other. I love to be surrounded with color and beautiful things, and I hope other people visiting the inn will find the same. Five Star Diamond Inn at Little Washington in Virginia is open for dinner only five nights a week. Here, the guests' experience begins before they even step out of their cars. The valets are, of course, the, the first uh, impression of the inn, so we always want them to be at attention and smiling at everybody as they come. We dress them in seersuckers for the summertime, and in the wintertime, we have tweeds, so we're trying to create a, a sense of place. They're a wonderful, wonderful addition. Patrick O'Connell, as well as you know, all of the dining room managers, are very attentive, and they're always constantly pushing us to do our best. You don't really realize until you're in this kind of environment how going just the small extra mile really makes the largest difference in somebody's stay. Um, you know, just getting the door every time, or just being there for somebody, being friendly conversation when you're getting them out of the car, it, it really is what makes the experience special for our guests service can really differentiate a place. You have to get inside the guest's head, you have to intuit what they're looking for, and you have to imagine their expectations, and then you have to adapt to the signals that they're giving you. Great service is about attention to detail that you give to the guest in terms of what they want and when they want it. For example, somebody is looking up. They're looking up for a reason. Maybe they want the bill, maybe they want more wine. So it's understanding what they want and just being there at the right time for them, just at that very moment. So we call up all of our guests behind the scenes humans. I just always say, how many humans are on that table? Or how many humans are we serving tonight? <laughs> One day a boy in the kitchen said, chef, chef, I mean, if they're humans, what are we? <laughs> and I said, you idiot, we're superhumans. <laughs> there is an amazing ballet that goes on in the dining room every night, and the restaurant dining room really needs to be set up so that that can happen smoothly and fluidly without the diners even noticing. The best service is the service that you don't even realize is there. Patrick is very keen on how we move in and around the dining room. So we always try and go in the same direction, and keep the flow of the dining room so there are no, uh, you know, no hiccups. Chef says that service done properly is a ballet. You know, when you move through the dining room, you're not bumping into each other. It's very smooth. He brought in a uh, professional ballet teacher, very, very talented dancer, and he worked with a lot of the staff members on being graceful. Chef likes to say that when, you know, when you're watching a ballet, nothing seems out of place until someone does something wrong, and then you really notice it. The Inn at Little Washington has become a firm favorite with American movers and shakers who travel from the capital to eat here. We get um, a lot of politicians because we're in 
uh, proximity to Washington, D.C. And we get um, our share of the glamour quotient. Over the years, we've had um, you know, a lot of actors and actresses, Jack Nicholson, Ryan Reynolds, Warren Beatty. Normally, we wouldn't serve uh, lunch, but we actually uh, opened up for Barbara Streisand. She came and had lunch one afternoon. It's always a buzz. Uh, the room always <laughs> loves it. There's just that little free zone that happens when somebody who is recognized by everyone walks through. We certainly have had a lot of celebrities. The ballet is particularly perfect on those nights. Patrick's exuberant and lavish take on grand British country house design extends even to the kitchen. After transforming the building into an English country house, it seemed only right that this should look like the original kitchen. I called Joyce, our designer, and I said, Joyce, have you ever done a kitchen before? And she said, no, but I'd love to have a go at it. I'd always been very inspired by certain kitchens I'd seen um, in country houses where they'd used a, a tile work to a great extent. Well, she channeled the dairy room at Windsor Castle, which was where the cheese was made, all in blue and white tiles. If you see the drawing of the kitchen and the completed result, the interpretation is remarkable. The kitchen might be inspired by 19th century British royals, but the food that comes out of it is pioneering American cuisine. Tasting menus start at $178 a head. For a small premium, there's a chef's table. Here, the self-taught king of modern American cookery calls on an even higher power to welcome his guests. Robert Mondavi, the famous California winemaker, once referred to me as the Pope of American cuisine. So we decided to have a little fun with that and have a formal arrival ceremony for each guest with an acolyte, a little incense. We take our work very seriously, but not ourselves. Welcome, so nice to have you here. We started it tongue in cheek and not knowing how the guests might respond and they find it so moving. There's nothing better than having the entire crew stop what they're doing and welcome them, greet them into our space. Just costs us a couple of minutes and a little coordination and we can give them an experience that they can't get anywhere else. Whether chef's table or main dining room, Meals end with another unique experience. Guests are offered their final course from the restaurant's very own cow. So this is uh, Farah, the cheese cart. She's modeled after a blue ribbon award winning cow from Iowa State Fair. Part of what Patrick does is inject humor uh, into the service. Every night a cheese cart is an option for dessert. It has uh, anywhere from 14 to 25 cheeses on it from all over the world. The guest reaction is, is they all love it. It's over the top, it's whimsical, and they all laugh. It's all about the show and the, the theater. All the heads turn in the restaurant. Everyone asks them a question, did that just move? Is that, is that a cow? What's on the cow? Every time the cow moves or moves, it's laughter. We like to have fun here. Yeah, we, we have fine dining with a little bit of soul. <laughs> People always ask me what makes the perfect dining experience because it's not just about what's lying on the plate. It depends on who you're there with and whether they've made you feel welcome. From the kitchen to all the waiters, you have to feel they want you to be there and they want you to have a good time. Chef has removed the stuffiness from fine dining. He wants you to feel as though you've just stepped into his home for a dinner party. And so Chef says, you know, sit back relax, enjoy yourself. You know, you're, you're our guests. Have some fun. 
Despite many years topping best restaurant lists, Patrick and his team take nothing for granted. We're all looking critically at our work. I think that's been an essential component to our success. We are our worst critics, and it's never good enough, and it's never going to be good enough. <laughs> I still think of humans as potentially dangerous creatures, but if they're chewing, you're usually safe in their presence. I still will look out in the dining room each night, and if someone's not chewing, <laughs> I worry. Hong Kong, this buzzing city off the south coast of China, is home to an eclectic mix of cultures. Where land is limited, a vertical city has been shaped out of glass and steel. Close to the city's glittering Victoria Harbour is the flagship Mandarin Oriental Hotel. Hidden deep in the heart of the hotel's kitchens lies an intimate dining room. Pairing highly creative dishes with one of the biggest names in Champagne, this is the Krug Room. The restaurant's secluded location means it's not a place a guest might stumble upon by chance. The restaurant is tucked away inside the kitchen in the heart of the hotel, and it's, you know, there's no signs for it. In the beginning, it was a private dining, but then the demand was so big for the last uh, two and a half, three years, it's been really like treated as a restaurant. You can book it uh, for a table of one, for a table of two, whatever it is. So the maximum, we can see 12 people in there. The restaurant teases its guests with its secret location. The only thing what you know when you make a booking for the restaurant is that you meet in the Mandarin Grill and Bar for a glass of champagne. Diners are collected from the bar and escorted behind the scenes through doors normally closed off to the public. I lead the guests uh, through this door. It's a very special place because it's uh, hiding and a secret place in the, in the hotel. En route, guests get to savor some of the hotel's other idiosyncratic delights. This chandelier is three tons. This is very, very heavy. Next will be the chinnery bar. So here you can see the decorations is still maintained very old English pop. And we have a very big collections of the whiskey in Hong Kong. Appetites whetted, guests are close to their destination. Then I will lead the diners to go through the door, which is a very exclusive uh, place. So this is um, the crew room door. Here we go. This is uh, the restaurant. This is the place. Cook room, there's a very, very special place because just like a chef pig run. So chef can push the boundary, he can do whatever you like. You know, if you've got a smaller restaurant like we have got with 12 seats, you can do much more, it's no limitations. The growing trend for what's called a chef's table in a restaurant is, I think, an awful lot of fun if you can afford it. The idea is that your table, rather than being separated out in the dining room, is there almost in the kitchen and that you'll see the food being produced around you then this can be actually a rather thrilling way to experience the best that a cook has to offer. just a normal meal. We want to create the environment and the theatre. The 
design here, you can look at this everywhere. It will look like a train carriage. Generally here you can see like uh, ice dropping down and this is like an ice bucket. Welcome. Thank you. There's a lot of different diners around here because uh, a lot of the local celebrity, businessmen and young people and some elder people. There's all different classes of people who come in here. German-born executive chef Uwe Opasensky has been catering for Krug Room guests since 2007. Hong Kong is such a, a busy city, so I think for me, I want, I'll try to take people away from that for two and a half hours where they don't think about whatever they do in their private life and just enjoy the company they're with and the conversation which comes out of food. During their dinner, guests have a front row seat on all the action. The windows are basically directly into our main kitchen. You've got like 30, 40 cooks in here rushing around, so it adds to a whole theater. And you sit in, in this restaurant in a very nice, calm environment. You don't hear much noise. You drink your glass of champagne, and you have got delicious food. But you know everything else around is buzzing and happening because it's a, an active kitchen. There are no limits to how a great dining experience can unfold, and the story that the chef and the restaurant wants to tell you when you're there. These days, it can be one small table where you're eating with other people, where you're sharing that experience, where you have to sit next to strangers, interacting very closely with the chef themselves. They are a way for the restaurant to execute their vision. Every night, you have like uh, eight to 12 courses menu. Depends on how Uwe want to make it uh, specials. Depends on the seasons, depends on the market, what they have it. So very uh, special dining. The focus is on the food and not on the show. Um, that's, that's for me is very important. I mean, the, first of all, it's the ingredient. And then the question what we have got for us as a team is how we deliver this ingredients in an interesting, different way which represents us. Chef Uwe works alongside head sommelier Ken Wong. The pair have the challenge of crafting menus that work in combination with just one particular brand of champagne. We are the only place in Hong Kong to offer this unique champagne pairing. And we had the best selection of the Kush champagne. And even some of those is not available in the public market. And I think the complexity of the champagne can really go well with some different type of food. You know, champagne is just very easy for, for tasting menus because it constantly refreshes your palates. It gets you ready for the next bite. You discover another layer of the champagne, of the food, so it's actually perfect. There's no limitations. I like to interact with my guests and share my knowledge so they can be enjoy the best cuisine and also experience something they never tried that before. Uwe's creative imagination goes beyond the skillful matching of food with bubbles. In this kitchen, dishes are served in unexpected ways and in unexpected forms. We look always at, at different vessels in different ways to, to represent it more. Like, you know, if you serve seafood, you know, you serve it in a shell or on coral. We try to make shapes of different things which look like something else. You know, we make stones out of scallops. So this is to confuse our guests. So you have got some real stones and some fake stones. So the, the real stones obviously are real stones and the fake ones are hamachi. Basically we freeze the fish, dip it, dip it in liquid nitrogen, dip it into the gelatin, dip it in liquid nitrogen, and then let it defrost. Smoke comes up and we put straight away all the seafood onto the table. So when the smoke comes down, the people will discover the seafood, okay? It's what I call the lab. That's where we play around. I'm more for the creative part. So I like the idea of creating new things and, and pushing myself. That's, that's who I am, you know. I, I get inspired by a lot of different things. So I'm trying to stay on the edge, you know, just, just to keep on pushing. Chefs have really embraced the science of food. Understanding science and using it to your advantage in the kitchen can only make your food more interesting, more exciting, and better. I love chefs who are so innovative that they are literally moving 
our industry forward. Okay, let's go. Even the service has been tailored for this intimate dining room. Here, the chefs don't just cook the food, they also dish it up. What we see now with certain restaurants, it's the cooks themselves who bring the dishes out to the table. So we no longer expect the, the cooks to be hidden away. We want to see that process and we like to see it before us. Chef Uwe leaves no stone unturned in his efforts to enrich the diner's experience. He wants to tickle not just their taste buds, but every one of their senses. I work with a perfumer in Spain who makes special flavors for us. We have got a dish which we call the seaside where we create sea smell. So, you know, what does the sea smell like when you are sitting by the beach and the, the water flash against the shore? That's our smoked salmon. Enjoy. Thank you. You know, for me, smell is a very important factor. Whenever you pick up, you always, the first thing you do, you look at it, and the second thing you do, you smell it. It's not enough for Uva that diners should merely taste the local organic produce at the core of much of his menu. He wants them to touch the hands of the farmers who produce it. But one issue I always have got that you will never see the people actually who produce this amazing product. So, I came up with the idea that we would take the farmer's hands and make them in clay. Fresh garden peas with a little bit of ricotta underneath. Um, then in here, as in every farm, you have got some snails They're in here. And in here, snails, yeah, of course, snails. <laughs> then here. So we use the hands to represent the things which come from the ground, from their farm, to your table. Dishes with this level of artistry can take many months to refine. So inevitably, dining here does come at a price. So the price will be stuck at 350 US dollars. Yes, it's not cheap, but we offer the high standard of service. So we expect that the guests will have the same level expectations. I think they are uh, highly demand, and of course they are spending a lot. You have to know the food ingredients, where it's from, and uh, maybe you have to know about the vitamins as well. <laughs> so they have a very high expectation for every single details. But sometimes, guests' expectations are turned completely upside down. So now it's cheese and ham. Um, but this ham is actually not from Spain, it's actually made in Hong Kong. Um, our pastry chef came up with the idea of doing a ham which is uh, not really ham, which is an ice cream. We talked about the flavors first, and then we made a mold out of it, and then so we have got now this beautiful Iberico ham. It's a very special breed. Whole ham is ice cream, vanilla and strawberry, so which I'm going to carve now for you. Pork as pudding. Farmer's hands for bowls, fish disguised as pebbles, and that's only the beginning. I think there's still lots of ideas bubbling around in my head, so there's, there's no end in sight, really. What I wish for is that, you know, they wa walk away and say that it was the best dinner they ever had, the most memorable dining experience, the best food they ever tasted. So this is the last thing from us tonight. I hope you have enjoyed. So this is our spring and summer garden. As long as you can combine the product with a fun experience around it, then that's a success. Perfection we will never achieve, but we have to go towards it. <laughs>